Section 13 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. April 14, 1938, Part 2 not only our future economic soundness but the very soundness of our democratic institutions depends on the determination of our government to give employment to idle men the people of america are in agreement in defending their liberties at any cost and the first line of that defense lies in the protection of economic security your government seeking to protect democracy must prove that government is stronger than the forces of business depression History proves that dictatorships do not grow out of strong and successful governments, but out of weak and helpless governments. If, by democratic methods, people get a government strong enough to protect them from fear and starvation, then their democracy succeeds. But if they do not, they grow impatient. Therefore, the only sure bulwark of continuing liberty is a government strong enough to protect the interests of the people and a people strong enough and well-informed enough to maintain its sovereign control over its government. We are a rich nation. We can afford to pay for security and prosperity without having to sacrifice our liberties into the bargain. In the first century of our republic, we were short of capital, short of workers, and short of industrial production. But we were rich in free land, free timber, and free mineral wealth the federal government rightly assumed the duty of promoting business and relieving depression by giving subsidies of land and other resources thus from our earliest days we have had a tradition of substantial government help to our system of private enterprise but today the government no longer has vast tracts of rich land to give away and we have discovered, too, that we must spend large sums of money to conserve our land from further erosion and our forests from further depletion. The situation is also very different from the old days, because now we have plenty of capital, banks and insurance companies loaded with idle money, plenty of industrial productive capacity, and many millions of workers looking for jobs. It is following tradition as well as necessity, if government strives to put idle money and idle men to work, to increase our public wealth and to build up the health and strength of the people, and to help our system of private enterprise to function. It is going to cost us something to get out of this recession this way, but the profit of getting out of it will pay for the cost several times over. Lost working time is lost money. Every day that a workman is unemployed, or a machine is unused, or a business organization is marking time, it is a loss to the nation. Because of idle men and idle machines, this nation lost $100 billion between 1929 and the spring of 1933 in less than four years. This year, you, the people of the country, are making about $12 billion less than last year. If you think back to the experiences of the early years of this administration, you will remember the doubts and fears expressed about the rising expenses of government. But to the surprise of the doubters, as we proceeded to carry on the program which included public works and work relief, the country grew richer instead of poorer. It is worthwhile to remember that the annual national people's income was thirty billion dollars more last year in nineteen thirty seven than it was in nineteen thirty two it is true that the national debt increased sixteen billion dollars but remember that in that increase must be included several billion dollars worth of assets which eventually will reduce that debt and that many billion dollars of permanent public improvements schools roads bridges tunnels public buildings, parks, and a host of other things, meet your eye in every one of the 3,100 counties of the United States. No doubt you will be told that the government spending program of the past five years did not cause this increase in our national income. 
they will tell you that business revived because of private spending and investment. That is true, in part, for the government spent only a small part of the total. But that government spending acted as the trigger that set off private activity. That is why the total addition to our national production and national income has been so much greater than the contribution of the government itself. In pursuance of that thought, I said to the Congress today, I want to make it clear that we do not believe that we can get an adequate rise in our national income merely by investing and lending and spending public funds. It is essential in our economy that private funds must be put to work, and all of us recognize that such funds are entitled to a fair profit. As national income rises, let us not forget that government expenditures will go down and government tax receipts will go up. The government contribution of land that we once made to business was the land of all the people, and the government contribution of money which we now make to business ultimately comes out of the labor of all the people. It is, therefore, only sound morality, as well as a sound distribution of buying power, that the benefits of the prosperity coming from this use of the money of all the people ought to be distributed among all the people, at the bottom as well as at the top. Consequently, I am again expressing my hope that the Congress will enact at this session a wage and hour bill putting a floor under industrial wages and a limit on working hours, to ensure a better distribution of our prosperity, a better distribution of available work, and a sounder distribution of buying power. You may get all kinds of impressions in regard to the total cost of this new program, or in regard to the amount that will be added to the national debt. It is a big program. Last autumn, in a sincere effort to bring government expenditures and government income into closer balance, the budget I worked out called for sharp decreases in government spending. In the light of the present conditions, those estimates were far too low. This new program adds $2 billion and $62 million to direct Treasury expenditures and another $950 million to government loans. The latter sum, because they are loans, will come back to the Treasury in the future. The net effect of the debt on the government is this. Between now and July 1, 1939, 15 months away, the Treasury will have to raise less than a billion and a half dollars of new money. Such an addition to the net debt of the United States need not give concern to any citizen, for it will return to the people of the United States many times over in increased buying power, and eventually in much greater government tax receipts because of the increase in the citizen income. What I said to the Congress in the close of my message I repeat to you. Let us unanimously recognize the fact that the federal debt, whether it be twenty-five billions or forty billions, can only be paid if the nation obtains a vastly increased citizen income. I repeat that if this citizen income can be raised to $80 billion a year, the national government and the overwhelming majority of state and local governments will be definitely out of the red. The higher the national income goes, the faster will we be able to reduce the total of federal and state and local debts. Viewed from every angle, today's purchasing power, the citizen's income of today, is not at this time sufficient to drive the economic system of America to higher speed. Responsibility of government requires us at this time to supplement the normal processes, and in so supplementing them to make sure that the addition is adequate. We must start again on a long, steady, upward incline in national income. And in that process, which I believe is ready to start, let us avoid the pitfalls of the past, the overproduction, the overspeculation, and indeed all the extremes which we did not succeed in avoiding in 1929. In all of this, the government cannot and should not act alone. Business must help, and I am sure business will help. We need more than the materials of recovery. We need a united national will. 
we need to recognize nationally that the demands of no group however just can be satisfied unless that group is prepared to share in finding a way to produce the income from which they and all other groups can be paid you as the congress i as the president must by virtue of our offices seek the national good by preserving the balance between all groups and all sections we have at our disposal the national resources the money the skill of hand and head to raise our economic level our citizens income our capacity is limited only by our ability to work together what is needed is the will the time has come to bring that will into action with every driving force at our command and i am determined to do my share certain positive requirements seem to me to accompany the will if we have that will there is placed on all of us the duty of self-restraint that is the discipline of a democracy every patriotic citizen must say to himself or herself that immoderate statements appeals to prejudice the creation of unkindness are offences not against an individual or individuals but offences against the whole population of the united states self-restraint implies restraint by articulate public opinion trained to distinguish fact from falsehood trained to believe that bitterness is never a useful instrument in public affairs there can be no dictatorship by an individual or by a group in this nation save through division fostered by hate such division there must never be and finally i should like to say a personal word to you i never forget that i live in a house owned by all the american people and that i have been given their trust i try always to remember that their deepest problems are human i constantly talk with those who come to tell me their own points of view with those who manage the great industries and financial institutions of the country with those who represent the farmer and the worker and often with average citizens without high position who come to this house and constantly i seek to look beyond the doors of the white house beyond the officialdom of the national capital into the hopes and fears of men and women in their homes i have traveled the country over many times my friends my enemies my daily mail bring me reports of what you are thinking and hoping i want to be sure that neither battles nor burdens of office shall ever blind me to an intimate knowledge of the way the american people want to live and the simple purposes for which they put me here in these great problems of government i try not to forget that what really counts at the bottom of it all is that the men and women willing to work can have a decent job to take care of themselves and their homes and their children adequately that the farmer the factory worker the storekeeper the gas station man the manufacturer the merchant big or small the banker who takes pride in the help that he can give to the building of his community that all of these can be sure of a reasonable profit and safety for the savings they earn not to-day nor to-morrow alone but as far ahead as they can see i can hear your unspoken wonder as to where we are headed in this troubled world i cannot expect all of the people to understand all of the people's problems but it is my job to try to understand those problems i always try to remember that reconciling differences cannot satisfy everyone completely because i do not expect too much i am not disappointed but i know that i must never give up that i must never let the greater interest of all the people down merely because that might be for the moment the easiest personal way out i believe that we have been right in the course that we have charted to abandon our purpose of building a greater more stable and more tolerant america would be to miss the tide and perhaps to miss the port i propose to sail ahead i feel sure that your hopes and your help are with me for to reach a port we must sail sail not lie at anchor sail not drift
End of section 13. Recording by Maria Casper. Section 14 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Section 14. June 24, 1938. Our government, happily, is a democracy as part of the democratic process your president is again taking an opportunity to report on the progress of national affairs to report to the real rulers of this country the voting public the seventy-fifth congress elected in november nineteen thirty six on a platform uncompromisingly liberal has adjourned barring unforeseen events there will be no session until a new congress to be elected in November assembles next January. On the one hand, the 75th Congress has left many things undone. For example, it refused to provide more business-like machinery for running the executive branch of the government. The Congress also failed to meet my suggestion that it take the far-reaching steps necessary to put the railroads of the country back on their feet. But on the other hand, the Congress, striving to carry out the platform on which most of its members were elected, achieved more for the good of the country than any Congress did between the end of the World War and the spring of 1933. I mention tonight only the more important of these achievements. 1. It improved still further our agricultural laws to give the farmer a fair share of the national income to preserve our soil, to provide an all-weather granary, to help the farm tenant towards independence, to find new uses for farm products, and to begin crop insurance. 2. After many requests on my part, the Congress passed a Fair Labor Standards Act commonly called the Wages and Hours Bill. That act, applying to products in interstate commerce, ends child labor sets a floor below wages and a ceiling over hours of labor except perhaps for the social security act it is the most far-reaching the most far-sighted program for the benefit of workers ever adopted here or in any other country without question it starts us toward a better standard of living and increases purchasing power to buy the products of farm and factory do not let any calamity howling executive with an income of a thousand dollars a day who has been turning his employees over to the government relief rolls in order to preserve his company's undistributed reserves tell you using his stockholders money to pay the postage for his personal opinions that a wage of eleven dollars a week is going to have a disastrous effect on all american industry Fortunately for business as a whole, and therefore for the nation, that type of executive is a rarity with whom most business executives most heartily disagree. 3. The Congress has provided a fact-finding commission to find a path through the jungle of contradictory theories about the wise business practices, to find the necessary facts for any intelligent legislation on monopoly, on price fixing, and on the relationship between big business and medium-sized business and little business. Different from a great part of the world, we in America persist in our belief in individual enterprise and in the profit motive, but we realize we must continually seek improved practices to ensure the continuance of reasonable profits together with scientific progress, individual initiative, opportunities for the little fellow, fair prices, decent wages, and continuing employment. 4. The Congress has coordinated the supervision of commercial aviation and air mail by establishing a new Civil Aeronautics Authority, and it has placed all postmasters under the Civil Service for the first time in our national history. 
5. The Congress set up the United States Housing Authority to help finance large-scale slum clearance and provide low-rent housing for the low-income groups in our cities. And by improving the Federal Housing Act, the Congress made it easier for private capital to build modest homes and low-rental dwellings. 6. The Congress has properly reduced taxes on small corporate enterprises and has made it easier for the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to make credit available to all business. I think the bankers of the country can fairly be expected to participate in loans where the government, through the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, offers to take a fair portion of the risk. 7. The Congress has provided additional funds for the Works Progress Administration, the Public Works Administration, the Rural Electrification Administration, the Civilian Conservation Corps, and other agencies in order to take care of what we hope is a temporary additional number of unemployed at this time and to encourage production of every kind by private enterprise. All these things together I call our program for the national defense of our economic system. It is a program of balanced action, of moving on all fronts at once, in intelligent recognition that all of our economic problems of every group and of every section of the country are essentially one problem. 8. Finally, because of increasing armaments in other nations and an international situation which is definitely disturbing to all of us, the Congress has authorized important additions to the national armed defense of our shores and our people. On another important subject, the net result of a struggle in the Congress has been an important victory for the people of the United States. What might well be called a lost battle which won a war. You will remember that on February 5, 1937, I sent a message to the Congress dealing with the real need of federal court reforms of several kinds. In one way or another, during the sessions of this Congress, the ends, the real objectives, sought in that message have been substantially obtained. The attitude of the Supreme Court towards constitutional questions is entirely changed. Its recent decisions are eloquent testimony of a willingness to collaborate with the two other branches of government to make democracy work. The government has been granted the right to protect its interest in litigation between private parties involving the constitutionality of federal and to appeal directly to the Supreme Court in all cases involving the constitutionality of federal statutes. And no single judge is any longer empowered to suspend a federal statute on his sole judgment as to its constitutionality. Justices of the Supreme Court may now retire at the age of 70 after 10 years of service. A substantial number of additional judgeships have been created in order to expedite the trial of cases. And finally, greater flexibility has been added to the federal judicial system by allowing judges to be assigned to congested districts. Another indirect accomplishment of this Congress has been its response to the devotion of the American people to a course of sane and consistent liberalism. The Congress has understood that under modern conditions, government has a continuing responsibility to meet continuing problems, and that government cannot take a holiday of a year or a month or even a day just because a few people are tired or frightened by the inescapable pace, fast pace, of this modern world in which we live. Some of my opponents and some of my associates have considered that I have a mistakenly sentimental judgment as to the tenacity of purpose and the general level of intelligence of the American people. I am still convinced that the American people, since 1932, continue to insist on two requisites of private enterprise and the relationship of government to it. The first is a complete honesty 
at the top in looking after the use of other people's money and in appropriating and paying individual and corporate taxes according to ability to pay the second is sincere respect for the need of all people who are at the bottom all people at the bottom who need to get work and through work to get a really fair share of the good things of life and a chance to save and rise after the election of nineteen thirty six i was told and the congress was told by an increasing number of politically and worldly wise people that i should coast along enjoy an easy presidency for four years and not take the democratic platform too seriously they told me that people were getting weary of reform through political effort and would no longer oppose that small minority which in spite of its own disastrous leadership in nineteen twenty nine is always eager to resume its control over the government of the united states never in our lifetime has such a concerted campaign of defeatism been thrown at the heads of the president and the senators and congressmen as in the case of this seventy-fifth congress never before have we had so many copperheads and you will remember that it was the copperheads who in the days of the war between the states tried their best to make president lincoln and his congress give up the fight let the nation remain split in two and return to peace peace at any price this congress has ended on the side of the people my faith in the american people and their faith in themselves have been justified i congratulate the congress and the leadership thereof and i congratulate the american people on their own staying power one word about our economic situation it makes no difference to me whether you call it a recession or a depression in nineteen thirty two the total national income of all the people in the country had reached the low point of thirty eight billion dollars in that year with each succeeding year it rose last year nineteen thirty seven it had risen to seventy billion dollars despite definitely worse business and agricultural prices in the last four months of last year this year nineteen thirty eight while it is too early to do more than give an estimate we hope that the national income will not fall below sixty billion dollars we remember also that banking and business and farming are not falling apart like the one hoss shay as they did in the terrible winter of nineteen thirty two nineteen thirty three last year mistakes were made by the leaders of private enterprise by the leaders of labor and by the leaders of government all three last year the leaders of private enterprise pleaded for a sudden curtailment of public spending and said they would take up the slack but they made the mistake of increasing their inventories too fast and setting many of their prices too high for their goods to sell some labor leaders goaded by decades of oppression of labor made the mistake of going too far they were not wise in using methods which frightened many well-wishing people they asked employers not to bargain with them but to put up with jurisdictional disputes at the same time government too made mistakes mistakes of optimism in assuming that industry and labor would themselves make no mistakes the government made a mistake of timing in not passing a farm bill or a wage and hour bill last year as a result of the lessons of these mistakes we hope that in the future private enterprise capital and labor alike will operate more intelligently together and operate in greater cooperation with their own government than they have in the past such cooperation on the part of both of them will be very welcome to me certainly at this stage there should be a united stand on the part of both of them to resist wage cuts which would further reduce purchasing power today a great steel company announced a reduction in prices with a view to stimulating business recovery and i was gratified to know that this reduction involved no wage cut every encouragement ought to be given to industry which accepts the large volume 
and high wage policy if this is done it ought to result in conditions which will replace a great part of the government spending which the failure of cooperation has made necessary this year from march four nineteen thirty three down not a single week has passed without a cry from the opposition a small opposition a cry to do something to say something to restore confidence there is a very articulate group of people in this country with plenty of ability to procure publicity for their views who have consistently refused to cooperate with the mass of the people whether things were going well or going badly on the ground that they required more concessions to their point of view before they would admit having what they called confidence these people demanded restoration of confidence when the banks were closed and demanded it again when the banks were reopened they demanded restoration of confidence when hungry people were thronging the streets and again when the hungry people were fed and put to work they demanded restoration of confidence when droughts hit the country and again now when our fields are laden with bounteous yields and excessive crops they demanded restoration of confidence last year when the automobile industry was running three shifts and turning out more cars than the country could buy and again this year when the industry is trying to get rid of an automobile surplus and has shut down its factories as a result it is my belief that many of these people who have been crying aloud for confidence are beginning today to realize that that hand has been overplayed and that they are now willing to talk cooperation instead it is my belief that the mass of the american people do have confidence in themselves have confidence in their ability with the aid of government to solve their own problems it is because you are not satisfied and i am not satisfied with the progress that we have made in finally solving our business and agricultural and social problems but i believe the great majority of you want your own government to keep on trying to solve them in simple frankness and in simple honesty i need all the help i can get and i see signs of getting more help in the future from many who have fought against progress with tooth and nail and now following out this line of thought i want to say a few words about the coming political primaries fifty years ago party nominations were generally made in conventions a system typified in the public imagination by a little group in a smoke-filled room who made out the party slates the direct primary was invented to make the nominating process a more democratic one to give the party voters themselves a chance to pick their party candidates what i am going to say to you tonight does not relate to the primaries of any particular political party but to matters of principle in all parties democrat republican farm labor progressive socialist or any other let that be clearly understood it is my hope that everybody affiliated with any party will vote in the primaries and that every such voter will consider the fundamental principles for which his or her party is on record that makes for a healthy choice between the candidates of the opposing parties on election day in november an election cannot give the country a firm sense of direction if it has two or more national parties which merely have different names but are as alike as their principles and aims as peas in the same pod in the coming primaries in all parties there will be many clashes between two schools of thought generally classified as liberal and conservative roughly speaking the liberal school of thought recognizes that the new conditions throughout the world call for new remedies those of us in america who hold to this school of thought insist that these new remedies can be adopted and successfully maintained in this country under our present form of government if we use government as an instrument of cooperation to provide these remedies we believe that we can solve our problems through continuing effort through democratic processes instead of fascism or communism we are opposed to the kind of moratorium on reform which in effect 
is reaction itself. Be it clearly understood, however, that when I use the word liberal, I mean the believer in progressive principles of democratic representative government and not the wild man who, in effect, leans in the direction of communism, for that is just as dangerous as fascism itself. The opposing or conservative school of thought as a general proposition does not recognize the need for government itself to step in and take action to meet these new problems. It believes that individual initiative and private philanthropy will solve them, that we ought to repeal many of the things we have done and go back, for instance, to the old gold standard, or stop all this business of old age pensions and unemployment insurance, or repeal the Securities and Exchange Act, or let monopolies thrive unchecked, return, in effect, to the kind of government that we had in the twenties. Assuming the mental capacity of all the candidates, the important question which it seems to me the primary voter must ask is this, to which of these general schools of thought does the candidate belong? As President of the United States, I'm not asking the voters of the country to vote for Democrats next November as opposed to Republicans or members of any other party, nor am I as President taking part in Democratic primaries. As the head of the Democratic Party, however, charged with the responsibility of carrying out the definitely liberal declaration of principles set forth in the 1936 Democratic platform, I feel that I have every right to speak in those few instances where there may be a clear-cut issue between candidates for a Democratic nomination involving these principles or involving a clear misuse of my own name. Do not misunderstand me. I certainly would not indicate a preference in a state primary merely because a candidate, otherwise liberal in outlook, had conscientiously differed with me on any single issue. I should be far more concerned about the general attitude of a candidate towards present-day problems and his own inward desire to get practical needs attended to in a practical way. We all know that progress may be blocked by outspoken reactionaries, and also by those who say yes to a progressive objective, but who always find some reason to oppose any special specific proposal to gain that objective. I call that type of candidate a yes-but fellow, and I am concerned about the attitude of a candidate or his sponsors with respect to the rights of American citizens to assemble peaceably and to express publicly their views and opinions on important social and economic issues. There can be no constitutional democracy in any community which denies to the individual his freedom to speak and worship as he wishes. The American people will not be deceived by anyone who attempts to suppress individual liberty under the pretense of patriotism. This being a free country with freedom of expression, especially with freedom of the press, there will be a lot of mean blows struck between now and election day. By blows, I mean misrepresentation, personal attack, and appeals to prejudice. It would be a lot better, of course, if campaigns everywhere could be waged with arguments instead of with blows. I hope the liberal candidates will confine themselves to argument and not resort to blows. In nine cases out of ten, the speaker or the writer who, seeking to influence public opinion, descends from calm argument to unfair blows, hurts himself more than his opponent. The Chinese have a story on this, a story based on three or four thousand years of civilization. Two Chinese coolies were arguing heatedly in the midst of a crowd. A stranger expressed surprise that no blows were being struck. His Chinese friend replied, The man who strikes first admits that his ideas have given out. I know that neither in the summer primaries nor in the November elections will the American voters fail to spot the candidate whose ideas have given out. End of section 14. Section 15 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. September 3, 1939. My fellow Americans and my friends. Tonight, my single duty is to speak to the whole of America. Until 4.30 this morning, I had hoped against hope that some miracle would prevent a devastating war in Europe and bring to an end the invasion of Poland by Germany. For four long years, a succession of actual wars and constant crises have shaken the entire world and have threatened in each case to bring on the gigantic conflict which is to-day unhappily a fact it is right that i should recall to your minds the consistent and at times successful efforts of your government in these crises to throw the full weight of the united states into the cause of peace in spite of spreading wars i think that we have every right and every reason to maintain as a national policy the fundamental moralities the teachings of religion and the continuation of efforts to restore peace for some day though the time may be distant we can be of even greater help to a crippled humanity it is right too to point out that the unfortunate events of these recent years have without question been based on the use of force and the threat of force and it seems to me clear even at the outbreak of this great war that the influence of america should be consistent in seeking for humanity a final peace which will eliminate as far as it is possible to do so the continued use of force between nations it is of course impossible to predict the future i have my constant stream of information from american representatives and other sources throughout the world you the people of this country are receiving news through your radios and your newspapers at every hour of the day you are i believe the most enlightened and the best informed people in all the world at this moment you are subjected to no censorship of news and i want to add that your government has no information which it withholds or which it has any thought of withholding from you at the same time as i told my press conference on friday it is of the highest importance that the press and the radio use the utmost caution to discriminate between actual verified fact on the one hand and mere rumor on the other i can add to that by saying that i hope the people of this country will also discriminate most carefully between news and rumor do not believe of necessity everything you hear or read check up on it first you must master at the outset a simple but unalterable fact in modern foreign relations between nations when peace has been broken anywhere the peace of all countries everywhere is in danger it is easy for you and for me to shrug our shoulders and to say that conflicts taking place thousands of miles from the continental united states and indeed thousands of miles from the whole american hemisphere do not seriously affect the americas and that all the united states has to do is to ignore them and go about its own business passionately though we may desire detachment we are forced to realize that every word that comes through the air every ship that sails the sea every battle that is fought does affect the american future let no man or woman thoughtlessly or falsely talk of america sending its armies to european fields at this moment there is being prepared a proclamation of american neutrality this would have been done even if there had been no neutrality statute on the books for this proclamation is in accordance with international law and in accordance with american policy this will be followed by a proclamation required by the existing neutrality act and i trust that in the days to come our neutrality can be made a true neutrality it is of the utmost importance that the people of this country with the best information in the world think things through 
the most dangerous enemies of american peace are those who without well-rounded information on the whole broad subject of the past the present and the future undertake to speak with assumed authority to talk in terms of glittering generalities to give to the nation assurances or prophecies which are of little present or future value i myself cannot and do not prophesy the course of events abroad and the reason is that because i have of necessity such a complete picture of what is going on in every part of the world that i do not dare to do so and the other reason is that i think it is honest for me to be honest with the people of the united states i cannot prophesy the immediate economic effect of this new war on our nation but i do say that no american has the moral right to profiteer at the expense either of his fellow-citizens or of the men the women and the children who are living and dying in the midst of war in europe some things we do know most of us in the united states believe in spiritual values most of us regardless of what church we belong to believe in the spirit of the new testament a great teaching which opposes itself to the use of force of armed force of marching armies and falling bombs the overwhelming masses of our people seek peace peace at home and the kind of peace in other lands which will not jeopardize our peace at home we have certain ideas and certain ideals of national safety and we must act to preserve that safety to-day and to preserve the safety of our children in future years that safety is and will be bound up with the safety of the western hemisphere and of the seas adjacent thereto we seek to keep war from our own firesides by keeping war from coming to the americas for that we have historic precedent that goes back to the days of the administration of president george washington it is serious enough and tragic enough to every american family in every state of the union to live in a world that is torn by wars on other continents those wars to-day affect every american home it is our national duty to use every effort to keep them out of the americas and at this time let me make the simple plea that partisanship and selfishness be adjourned and that national unity be the thought that underlies all others this nation will remain a neutral nation but i cannot ask that every american remain neutral in thought as well even a neutral has the right to take account of facts even a neutral cannot be asked to close his mind or his conscience i have said not once but many times that i have seen war and that i hate war i say that again and again i hope the united states will keep out of this war i believe that it will and i give you assurance and reassurance that every effort of your government will be directed toward that end as long as it remains within my power to prevent there will be no blackout of peace in the united states End of section 15section 16 of the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michael fascio the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt by franklin d roosevelt may 26th 1940 Part one. My friends, at this moment of sadness throughout most of the world, I want to talk with you about a number of subjects that directly affect the future of the United States. We are shocked by the almost incredible eyewitness stories that come to us, stories of what is happening at this moment to the civilian populations of Norway and Holland and Belgium and Luxembourg and France. I think it is right on this Sabbath evening that I should say a word in behalf of women and children and old men who need help, immediate help in their present distress, help from us across the seas, 
help from us who are still free to give it. Tonight, over the once peaceful roads of Belgium and France, millions are now moving, running from their homes to escape bombs and shells and fire and machine gunning, without shelter and almost wholly without food. They stumble on, knowing not where the end of the road will be. I speak to you of these people because each one of you that is listening to me tonight has a way of helping them. The American Red Cross, that represents each of us, is rushing food and clothing and medical supplies to these destitute civilian millions. Please, I beg you, please give according to your means to your nearest Red Cross chapter. Give as generously as you can. I ask this in the name of our common humanity. Let us sit down together again, you and I, to consider our own pressing problems that confront us. There are many among us who in the past closed their eyes to events abroad, because they believed in utter good faith what some of their fellow Americans told them, that what was taking place in Europe was none of our business, that no matter what happened over there, the United States could always pursue its peaceful and unique course in the world. There are many among us who closed their eyes, from lack of interest or lack of knowledge, honestly and sincerely thinking that the many hundreds of miles of salt water made the American hemisphere so remote that the people of North and Central and South America could go on living in the midst of their vast resources without reference to or danger from other continents of the world. There are some among us who were persuaded by minority groups that we could maintain our physical safety by retiring within our continental boundaries, the Atlantic on the east, the Pacific on the west, Canada on the north, and Mexico on the south. I illustrated the futility, the impossibility of that idea in my message to the Congress last week. Obviously, a defense policy based on that is merely to invite future attack. And finally, there are a few among us who have deliberately and consciously closed their eyes because they were determined to be opposed to their government, its foreign policy, and every other policy, to be partisan, and to believe that anything that the government did was wholly wrong. To those who have closed their eyes for any of these many reasons, to those who would not admit the possibility of the approaching storm, to all of them the past two weeks have meant the shattering of many illusions. They have lost the illusion that we are remote and isolated, and, therefore, secure against the dangers from which no other land is free. In some quarters, with this rude awakening has come fear, fear bordering on panic. It is said that we are defenseless. It is whispered by some that only by abandoning our freedom, our ideals, our way of life, can we build our defenses adequately. Can we match the strength of the aggressors? I did not share those illusions. I do not share these fears. Today, we are now more realistic. But let us not be calamity howlers and discount our strength. Let us have done with both fears and illusions. On this Sabbath evening, in our homes in the midst of our American families, let us calmly consider what we have done and what we must do. In the past two or three weeks, all kinds of stories have been handed out to the American public about our lack of preparedness. It has even been charged that the money we have spent on our military and naval forces during the last few years has gone down the rat hole. I think that it is a matter of fairness to the nation that you hear the facts. Yes, we have spent large sums of money on the national defense. This money has been used to make our Army and Navy today the largest, the best equipped, and the best trained peacetime military establishment in the whole history of this country. Let me tell you just a few of the many things accomplished during the past few years. I do not propose to go into every detail. It is a known fact, however, that in 1933, when this administration came into office, 
the United States Navy had fallen in standing among the navies of the world, in power of ships and in efficiency, to a relatively low ebb. The relative fighting power on the Navy had been greatly diminished by failure to replace ships and equipment, which had become out of date. But between 1933 and this year, 1940, seven fiscal years, your government will have spent $1,487,000,000 more than it spent on the Navy during the seven years that preceded 1933. What did we get for this money? The fighting personnel of the Navy rose from 79,000 to 145,000. During this period, 215 ships for the fighting fleet have been laid down or commissioned, practically seven times the number in the preceding seven-year period. Of these 215 ships we have commissioned, 12 cruisers, 63 destroyers, 26 submarines, three aircraft carriers, two gunboats, seven auxiliaries, and many smaller craft. And among the many ships now being built and paid for as we build them are eight new battleships. Ship construction, of course, costs millions of dollars, more in the United States than anywhere else in the world. But it is a fact that we cannot have adequate Navy defense for all American waters without ships, ships that sail the surface of the ocean, ships that move under the surface, and ships that move through the air. And, speaking of airplanes that work with the Navy, in 1933 we had 1,127 useful aircraft, and today we have 2,892 on hand and on order. Nearly all of the old planes of 1933 have been replaced by new planes, because they became obsolete or worn out. The Navy is far stronger today than any peacetime period in the whole long history of the nation. In hitting power and in efficiency, I would even make the assertion that it is stronger today than it was during the World War. The Army of the United States In 1933, it consisted of 122,000 enlisted men. Now, in 1940, that number has been practically doubled. The Army of 1933 had been given few new implements of war since 1919, and had been compelled to draw on old reserve stocks left over from the World War. The net result of all this was that our Army by 1933 had very greatly declined in its ratio of strength with the armies of Europe and of the Far East. That was the situation I found. But since then, great changes have taken place. Between 1933 and 1940, these past seven fiscal years, your government will have spent $1,292,000,000 more than it spent on the Army the previous seven years. What did we get for this money? The personnel of the Army, as I have said, has been almost doubled, and by the end of this year every existing unit of the present regular Army will be equipped with its complete requirements of modern weapons. Existing units of the National Guard will also be largely equipped with similar items. Here are some striking examples taken from a large number. Since 1933, we have actually purchased 5,640 airplanes including the most modern type of long-range bombers and fast-pursuit planes, though, of course, many of these which were delivered four, five, six, or seven years ago have worn out through use and been scrapped. We must remember that these planes cost money, a lot of it. For example, one modern four-engine long-range bombing plane cost $350,000. One modern interceptor pursuit plane cost $133,000. One medium bomber cost $160,000. In 1933, we had only 355 anti-aircraft guns. We now have more than 1,700 modern anti-craft guns of all types on hand or on order. 
and you ought to know that a three-inch anti-aircraft gun cost forty thousand dollars without any of the fire control equipment that goes with it. In 1933, there were only 24 modern infantry mortars in the entire army. We now have on hand and on order more than 1,600. In 1933, we had only 48 modern tanks and armored cars. Today, we have on hand and on order 1,700. In each of our modern tanks cost $46,000. There are many other items in which our progress since 1933 has been rapid, and the great proportion of this advance consists of really modern equipment. In 1933, on the personnel side, we had 1,263 Army pilots. Today, the Army alone has more than 3,000 of the best fighting flyers in the world, flyers who last year flew more than one million hours in combat training. That figure does not include the hundreds of splendid pilots in the National Guard and in the organized reserves. Within the past year, the productive capacity of the aviation industry to produce military planes has been tremendously increased. In the past year, the capacity more than doubled, but that capacity is still inadequate. However, the government, working with industry, is determined to increase that capacity to meet our needs. We intend to harness the efficient machinery of these manufacturers to the government's program of being able to get 50,000 planes a year. One additional word about aircraft, about which we read so much. Recent wars, including the current war in Europe, have demonstrated beyond doubt that fighting efficiency depends on unity of command, unity of control. In sea operations, the airplane is just as much an integral part of the unity of operations as are the submarine, the destroyer, and the battleship. And in land warfare, the airplane is just as much a part of military operations as are the tank corps, the engineers, the artillery, or the infantry itself. Therefore, the air forces should continue to be part of the Army and Navy. In line with my request, the Congress, this week, is voting the largest appropriation ever asked by the Army or the Navy in peacetime. And the equipment and training provided for them will be in addition to the figures I have given you. The world situation may so change that it will be necessary to reappraise our program at any time. And in such case, I am confident that the Congress and Chief Executive will work in harmony as a team, as they are doing today. End of Section 16 Recording by Michael Fascio. Section 17 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. May 26th, 1940, Part 2. I will not hesitate at any moment to ask for additional funds when they are required. In this era of swift, mechanized warfare, we all have to remember that what is modern today and up-to-date, what is efficient and practical, becomes obsolete and outworn tomorrow. Even while the production line turns out airplanes, New airplanes are being designed on the drafting table. Even as a cruiser slides down the launching ways, plans for improvement, plans for increased efficiency in the next model, are taking shape in the blueprints of designers. Every day's fighting in Europe, on land, on sea, and in the air, discloses constant changes in methods of warfare. We are constantly improving and redesigning, testing new weapons, learning the lessons of the immediate war, and seeking to produce in accordance with the latest that the brains of science can conceive. We are calling upon the resources, the efficiency, and the ingenuity of the American manufacturers of war material of all kinds, airplanes and tanks and guns and ships, and all the hundreds of products that go into this material. The government of the United States itself manufactures few of the implements of war, 
Private industry will continue to be the source of most of this material, and private industry will have to be speeded up to produce it at the rate and efficiency called for by the needs of the times. I know that private business cannot be expected to make all of the capital investment required for expansions of plants and factories and personnel which this program calls for at once. It would be unfair to expect industrial corporations or their investors to do this, when there is a chance that a change in international affairs may stop or curtail future orders a year or two hence. Therefore, the government of the United States stands ready to advance the necessary money to help provide for the enlargement of factories, the establishment of new plants, the employment of thousands of necessary workers, the development of new sources of supply for the hundreds of raw materials required, the development of quick mass transportation of supplies. And the details of all of this are now being worked out in Washington, day and night. We are calling on men now engaged in private industry to help us in carrying out this program, and you will hear more of this in detail in the next few days. This does not mean that the men we call upon will be engaged in the actual production of this material. That will still have to be carried on in the plants and factories throughout the land. Private industry will have the responsibility of providing the best, speediest, and most efficient mass production of which it is capable. The functions of the businessmen, whose assistance we are calling upon, will be to coordinate this program, to see to it that all the plants continue to operate at maximum speed and efficiency. Patriotic Americans, of proven merit and of unquestioned ability in their special fields, are coming to Washington to help the government with their training, their experience, and their capability. It is our purpose not only to speed up production, but to increase the total facilities of the nation in such a way that they can be further enlarged to meet emergencies of the future. But as this program proceeds, there are several things we must continue to watch and safeguard things which are just as important to the sound defense of a nation as physical armament itself. While our navy, and our airplanes, and our guns, and our ships may be our first line of defense, it is still clear that way down at the bottom, underlying them all, giving them their strength, sustenance, and power, are the spirit and morale of a free people. For that reason, we must make sure, in all that we do, that there be no breakdown or cancellation of any of the great social gains which we have made in these past years. We have carried on an offensive on a broad front against social and economic inequalities and abuses which had made our society weak. That offensive should not now be broken down by the pincers movement of those who would use the present needs of physical military defense to destroy it. There is nothing in our present emergency to justify making the workers of our nation toil for longer hours than now limited by statute. As more orders come in, and as more work has to be done, tens of thousands of people, who are now unemployed, will, I believe, receive employment. There is nothing in our present emergency to justify a lowering of the standards of employment. Minimum wages should not be reduced. It is my hope, indeed, that the new speed-up of production will cause many businesses which now pay below minimum standards to bring their wages up. There is nothing in our present emergency to justify a breaking down of old age pensions or of unemployment insurance. I would rather see the systems extended to other groups who do not now enjoy them. There is nothing in our present emergency to justify a retreat from any of our social objectives, from conservation of natural resources, assistance to agriculture, housing, and help to the underprivileged. Conversely, however, I am sure that responsible leaders will not permit some specialized group, which represents a minority of the total employees of a plant or an industry, 
to break up the continuity of employment of the majority of employees. Let us remember that the policy and the laws that provide for collective bargaining are still in force. I can assure you that labor will be adequately represented in Washington in the carrying out of this program of defense. Also, our present emergency and a common sense of decency make it imperative that no new group of war millionaires shall come into being in this nation as a result of the struggles abroad. The American people will not relish the idea of any American citizen growing rich and fat in an emergency of blood and slaughter and human suffering. And, last of all, this emergency demands that the consumers of America be protected so that our general cost of living can be maintained at a reasonable level. We ought to avoid the spiral processes of the world war, the rising spiral of costs of all kinds. The soundest policy is for every employer in the country to help give useful employment to the millions who are unemployed. By giving to those millions an increased purchasing power, the prosperity of the whole nation will rise to a much higher level. Today's threat to our national security is not a matter of military weapons alone. We know of new methods of attack. The Trojan Horse, the fifth column that betrays a nation unprepared for treachery. Spies, saboteurs, and traitors are the actors in this new strategy. With all of these we must and will deal vigorously. But there is an added technique for weakening a nation at its very roots, for disrupting the entire pattern of life of a people. And it is important that we understand it. The method is simple. It is, first, a dissemination of discord. A group, not too large, a group that may be sectional or racial or political, is encouraged to exploit its prejudices through false slogans and emotional appeals. The aim of those who deliberately egg on these groups is to create confusion of counsel, public indecision, political paralysis, and, eventually, a state of panic. Sound national policies come to be viewed with a new and unreasoning skepticism, not through the wholesome political debates of honest and free men, but through the clever schemes of foreign agents. As a result of these new techniques, armament programs may be dangerously delayed. Singleness of national purpose may be undermined. Men can lose confidences in each other, and therefore lose confidence in the efficacy of their own united action. Faith and courage can yield to doubt and fear. The unity of the state can be so sapped that its strength is destroyed. All this is no idle dream. It has happened time after time, in nation after nation, during the last two years. Fortunately, American men and women are not easy dupes. Campaigns of group hatred or class struggle have never made much headway among us, and are not making headway now. But new forces are being unleashed, deliberately planned propaganda to divide and weaken us in the face of danger as other nations have been weakened before. These dividing forces are undiluted poison. They must not be allowed to spread in the new world as they have in the old. Our morale and our mental defenses must be raised up as never before against those who would cast a smokescreen across our vision. The development of our defense program makes it essential that each and every one of us, men and women, feel that we have some contribution to make towards the security of our nation. At this time, when the world, and the world includes our own American hemisphere, when the world is threatened by forces of destruction, it is my resolve and yours to build up our armed defenses. We shall build them to whatever heights the future may require. We shall rebuild them swiftly, as the methods of warfare swiftly change. For more than three centuries, we Americans have been building on this continent a free society, a society in which the promise of the human spirit may find fulfillment. 
commingled here are the blood and genius of all the peoples of the world who have sought this promise we have built well we are continuing our efforts to bring the blessings of a free society of a free and productive economic system to every family in the land this is the promise of america it is this that we must continue to build this that we must continue to defend it is the task of our generation yours and mine but we build and defend not for our generation alone we defend the foundations laid down by our fathers. We build a life for generations yet unborn. We defend and we build a way of life, not for America alone, but for all mankind. Ours is a high duty, a noble task. Day and night I pray for the restoration of peace in this mad world of ours. It is not necessary that I, the President asked the American people to pray in behalf of such a cause, for I know you are praying with me. I am certain that out of the hearts of every man, woman, and child in this land, in every waking minute, a supplication goes up to Almighty God, that all of us beg that suffering and starving, that death and destruction may end, and that peace may return to the world. In common affection for all mankind, your prayers join with mine, that God will heal the wounds and the hearts of humanity. End of section 17. Section 18 of the Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Fireside Chats of Franklin Delano Roosevelt by Franklin D. Roosevelt. September 11, 1941. My fellow Americans, the Navy Department of the United States has reported to me that on the morning of September 4th, the United States destroyer Greer, proceeding in full daylight toward Iceland, had reached a point southeast of Greenland. She was carrying American mail to Iceland. She was flying the American flag. Her identity as an American ship was unmistakable. She was then and there attacked by a submarine. Germany admits that it was a German submarine. The submarine deliberately fired a torpedo at the Greer, followed later by another torpedo attack. In spite of what Hitler's propaganda bureau has invented, and in spite of what my American obstructionist organization may prefer to believe, I tell you the blunt fact that the German submarine fired first upon this American destroyer without warning, and with deliberate design to sink her. Our destroyer at the time was in waters which the government of the United States has declared to be waters of self-defense, surrounding outposts of American protection in the Atlantic. In the north of the Atlantic, Outposts have been established by us in Iceland, in Greenland, in Labrador, and in Newfoundland. Through these waters there pass many ships of many flags. They bear food and other supplies to civilians, and they bear material of war for which the people of the United States are spending billions of dollars, and which by congressional action they have declared to be essential for the defense of our own land. The United States destroyer, when attacked, was proceeding on a legitimate mission. If the destroyer was visible to the submarine when the torpedo was fired, then the attack was a deliberate attempt by the Nazis to sink a clearly identified American warship. On the other hand, if the submarine was beneath the surface of the sea, and with the aid of its listening devices fired in the direction of the sound of the American destroyer without even taking the trouble to learn its identity, as the official German communique would indicate, then the attack was even more outrageous, for it indicates a policy of indiscriminate violence against any vessel sailing the seas, belligerent or non-belligerent. This was piracy, piracy legally and morally. It was not the first nor the last act of piracy which the Nazi government has committed against the American flag in this war, for attack has followed attack. 
a few months ago an american flag merchant ship the robin moor was sunk by a nazi submarine in the middle of the south atlantic under circumstances violating long-established international law and violating every principle of humanity the passengers and crew were forced into open boats hundreds of miles from land in direct violation of international agreements signed by nearly all nations including the government of germany no apology no allegation of mistake no offer of reparations has come from the nazi government in july nineteen forty one nearly two months ago an american battleship in north american waters was followed by a submarine which for a long time sought to maneuver itself into a position of attack upon the battleship the periscope of the submarine was clearly seen no british or american submarines were within hundreds of miles of this spot at the time so the nationality of the submarine is clear five days ago a united states navy ship on patrol picked up three survivors of an american-owned ship operating under the flag of our sister republic of panama the s s sessa on august seventeenth she had been first torpedoed without warning and then shelled near greenland while carrying civilian supplies to iceland it is feared that the other members of her crew have been drowned in view of the established presence of german submarines in this vicinity there can be no reasonable doubt as to the identity of the flag of the attacker five days ago another united states merchant ship the steel seafarer was sunk by a german aircraft in the red sea two hundred and twenty miles south of suez she was bound for an egyptian port so four of the vessels sunk or attacked flew the american flag and were clearly identifiable two of these ships were warships of the american navy in the fifth case the vessel sunk clearly carried the flag of our sister republic panama in the face of all this we americans are keeping our feet on the ground our type of democratic civilization has outgrown the thought of feeling compelled to fight some other nation by reason of any single piratical attack on one of our ships we are not becoming hysterical or losing our sense of proportion therefore what i am thinking and saying to-night does not relate to any isolated episode instead we americans are taking a long-range point of view in regard to certain fundamentals and to a series of events on land and on sea which must be considered as a whole as a part of a world pattern it would be unworthy of a great nation to exaggerate an isolated incident or to become inflamed by some one act of violence but it would be inexcusable folly to minimize such incidents in the face of evidence which makes it clear that the incident is not isolated but is part of a general plan the important truth is that these acts of international lawlessness are manifestations of a design which has been made clear to the american people for a long time it is the nazi design to abolish the freedom of the seas and so acquire absolute control and domination of these seas for themselves for with control of the seas in their own hands the way can obviously become clear for their next step domination of the united states domination of the western hemisphere by force of arms under nazi control of the seas no merchant ship of the united states or of any other american republic would be free to carry on any peaceful commerce except by the condescending grace of this foreign and tyrannical power the atlantic ocean which has been and which should always be a free and friendly highway for us would then become a deadly menace to the commerce of the united states to the coasts of the united states and even to the inland cities of the united states the hitler government in defiance of the laws of the sea in defiance of the recognized rights of all other nations has presumed to declare on paper the great areas of the seas even including a vast expanse lying in the western hemisphere are to be closed and that no ships may enter them for any purpose except at peril of being sunk actually they are sinking ships at will and without warning in widely separated areas both within and far outside of these far-flung pretended zones this nazi attempt to seize control of the ocean is but a counterpart of the nazi plots now being carried on throughout the western hemisphere all designed toward the same end 
for hitler's advance guards not only his avowed agents but also his dupes among us have sought to make ready for him footholds and bridgeheads in the new world to be used as soon as he has gained control of the oceans his intrigues his plans his machinations his sabotage in this new world are all known to the government of the united states conspiracy has followed conspiracy for example last year a plot to seize the government of uruguay was smashed by the prompt action of that country which was supported in full by her american neighbors a like plot was then hatching in argentina and that government has carefully and wisely blocked it at every point more recently an endeavor was made to subvert the government of bolivia and within the past few weeks the discovery was made of secret air landing fields in colombia within easy range of the panama canal i could multiply instance upon instance to be ultimately successful in world mastery hitler knows that he must get control of the seas he must first destroy the bridge of ships which we are building across the atlantic over which we shall continue to roll the implements of war to help destroy him to destroy all his works in the end he must wipe out our patrol on sea and in the air if he is to do it he must silence the british navy i think it must be explained over and over again to people who like to think of the united states as an invincible protection that this can be true only if the british navy survives and that my friends is simple arithmetic for if the world outside of the americas falls under axis domination the shipbuilding facilities which the axis powers could then possess in all of europe in the british isles and in the far east would be much greater than all the shipbuilding facilities and potentialities of all the americas not only greater but two or three times greater enough to win even if the united states threw all its resources into such a situation seeking to double and even redouble the size of our navy the axis powers and control of the rest of the world would have the manpower and the physical resources to outbuild us several times over it is time for all americans americans of all the americas to stop being deluded by the romantic notion that the americas can go on living happily and peacefully in a nazi dominated world generation after generation america has battled for the general policy of freedom of the seas and that policy is a very simple one but basic a fundamental one it means that no nation has the right to make the broad oceans of the world at great distance from the actual theatre of land war unsafe for the commerce of others that has been our policy proved time and time again in all of our history our policy has applied from the earliest days of the republic and still applies not merely to the atlantic but to the pacific and to all other oceans as well unrestricted submarine warfare in nineteen forty one constitutes a defiance an act of aggression against that historic american policy it is now clear that hitler has begun his campaign to control the seas by ruthless force and by wiping out every vestige of international law every vestige of humanity his intention has been made clear the american people can have no further illusions about it no tender whisperings of appeasers that hitler is not interested in the western hemisphere no soporific lullabies that a wide ocean protects us from him can long have any effect on the hard-headed far-sighted and realistic american people because of these episodes because of the movements and operations of german warships and because of the clear repeated proof that the present government of germany has no respect for treaties or for international law that it has no decent attitude toward neutral nations or human life we americans are now face to face not with abstract theories but with cruel relentless facts this attack on the greer was no localized military operation in the north atlantic this was no mere episode in a struggle between two nations this was one determined step toward creating a permanent world system based on force on terror and on murder and i am sure that even now the nazis are waiting to see whether the united states will by silence give them the green light to go ahead on this path of destruction the nazi danger to our western world has long ceased to be a mere possibility 
the danger is here now not only from a military enemy but from an enemy of all law all liberty all morality all religion there has now come a time when you and i must see the cold inexorable necessity of saying to these inhuman unrestrained seekers of world conquest and permanent world domination by the sword you seek to throw our children and our children's children into your form of terrorism and slavery you have now attacked our own safety you shall go no further normal practices of diplomacy note writing are of no possible use in dealing with international outlaws who sink our ships and kill our citizens one peaceful nation after another has met disaster because each refused to look the nazi danger squarely in the eye until it had actually had them by the throat the united states will not make that fatal mistake no act of violence no act of intimidation will keep us from maintaining intact two bulwarks of american defense first our line of supply of material to the enemies of hitler and second the freedom of our shipping on the high seas no matter what it takes no matter what it costs we will keep open the line of legitimate commerce in these defensive waters we have sought no shooting war with hitler we do not seek it now but neither do we want peace so much that we are willing to pay for it by permitting him to attack our naval and merchant ships while they are on legitimate business i assume that the german leaders are not deeply concerned tonight or any other time by what we americans or the american government say or publish about them we cannot bring about the downfall of nazism by the use of long-range invective but when you see a rattlesnake poised to strike you do not wait until he is struck before you crush him these nazi submarines and raiders are the rattlesnakes of the atlantic they are a menace to the free pathways of a high seas they are a challenge to our own sovereignty they hammer at our most precious rights when they attack ships of the american flag symbols of our independence our freedom our very life it is clear to all americans that the time has come when the americas themselves must now be defended a continuation of attacks in our own waters or in waters that could be used for further and greater attacks on us will inevitably weaken our american ability to repel hitlerism do not let us be hair splitters let us not ask ourselves whether the americas should begin to defend themselves after the first attack or the fifth attack or the tenth attack or the twentieth attack the time for active defense is now do not let us split hairs let us not say we will only defend ourselves if the torpedo succeeds in getting home or if the crew and passengers are drowned this is the time for prevention of attack if submarines or raiders attack in distant waters they can attack equally well within sight of our own shores their very presence in any waters which america deems vital to its defense constitutes an attack in the waters which we deem necessary for our defense american naval vessels and american planes will no longer wait until axis submarines lurking under the water or axis raiders on the surface of the sea strike their deadly blow first upon our naval and air patrol now operating in large number over a vast expanse of the atlantic ocean falls the duty of maintaining the american policy of freedom of the seas now that means very simply very clearly that our patrolling vessels and planes will protect all merchant ships not only american ships but ships of any flag engaged in commerce in our defensive waters they will protect them from submarines they will protect them from surface raiders this situation is not new the second president of the united states john adams ordered the united states navy to clean out european privateers and european ships of war which were infesting the caribbean and south american waters destroying american commerce the third president of the united states thomas jefferson ordered the united states navy to end the attacks being made upon american and other ships by the corsairs of the nations of north africa my obligation as president is historic it is clear it is inescapable 
it is no act of war on our part when we decide to protect the seas that are vital to american defense the aggression is not ours ours is solely defense but let this warning be clear from now on if german or italian vessels of war enter the waters the protection of which is necessary for american defense they do so at their own peril the orders which i have given as commander-in-chief of the united states army and navy are to carry out that policy at once the sole responsibility rests upon germany there will be no shooting unless germany continues to seek it that is my obvious duty in this crisis that is the clear right of this sovereign nation this is the only step possible if we would keep tight the wall of defense which we are pledged to maintain around this western hemisphere i have no illusions about the gravity of this step i have not taken it hurriedly or lightly it is the result of months and months of constant thought and anxiety and prayer in the protection of your nation and mine it cannot be avoided the american people have faced other grave crises in their history with american courage and with american resolution they will do no less today they know the actualities of the attacks upon us they know the necessities of a bold defense against these attacks they know that the times call for clear heads and fearless hearts and with that inner strength that comes to a free people conscious of their duty and conscious of the righteousness of what they do they will with divine help and guidance stand their ground against this latest assault upon their democracy their sovereignty and their freedom end of section eighteen section twenty two of the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson the fireside chats of franklin delano roosevelt by franklin d roosevelt december ninth nineteen forty one my fellow americans the sudden criminal attacks perpetrated by the japanese in the pacific provide the climax of a decade of international immorality powerful and resourceful gangsters have banded together to make war upon the whole human race their challenge has now been flung at the united states of america the japanese have treacherously violated the long-standing peace between us many american soldiers and sailors have been killed by enemy action american ships have been sunk american airplanes have been destroyed the congress and the people of the united states have accepted that challenge together with other free peoples we are now fighting to maintain our right to live among our world neighbors in freedom in common decency without fear of assault i have prepared the full record of our past relations with japan and it will be submitted to the congress it begins with the visit of commodore perry to japan eighty-eight years ago it ends with the visit of two japanese emissaries to the secretary of state last sunday an hour after japanese forces had loosed their bombs and machine guns against our flag our forces and our citizens i can say with utmost confidence that no americans to-day or a thousand years hence need feel anything but pride in our patience and in our efforts through all the years toward achieving a peace in the pacific which would be fair and honorable to every nation large or small and no honest person to-day or a thousand years hence will be able to suppress a sense of indignation and horror at the treachery committed by the military dictators of japan under the very shadow of the flag of peace borne by their special envoys in our midst the course that japan has followed for the past ten years in asia has paralleled the course of hitler and mussolini in europe and in africa to-day it has become far more than a parallel it is actual collaboration so well calculated that all the continents of the world and all the oceans are now considered by the axis strategists as one gigantic battlefield in nineteen thirty one ten years ago 
Japan invaded Manchuko without warning. In 1935, Italy invaded Ethiopia without warning. In 1938, Hitler occupied Austria without warning. In 1939, Hitler invaded Czechoslovakia without warning. Later, in 39, Hitler invaded Poland without warning. In 1940, Hitler invaded Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg without warning. In 1940, Italy attacked France and later Greece without warning. And this year, in 1941, the Axis powers attacked Yugoslavia and Greece, and they dominated the Balkans without warning. In 1941, also, Hitler invaded Russia without warning. And now Japan has attacked Malaya and Thailand and the United States without warning. It is all of one pattern. We are now in this war. We are all in it, all the way. Every single man, woman, and child is a partner in the most tremendous undertaking of our American history. We must share together the bad news and the good news, the defeats and the victories, the changing fortunes of war. So far, the news has been all bad. We have suffered a serious setback in Hawaii. Our forces in the Philippines, which include the brave people of that commonwealth, are taking punishment, but are defending themselves vigorously. The reports from Guam and Wake and Midway Islands are still confused, but we must be prepared for the announcement that all these three outposts have been seized. The casualty lists of these first few days will undoubtedly be large. I deeply feel the anxiety of all the families of the men in our armed forces and the relatives of people in cities which have been bombed. I can only give them my solemn promise that they will get news just as quickly as possible. The government will put its trust in the stamina of the American people, and we will give the facts to the public just as soon as two conditions have been fulfilled. First, that the information has been definitely and officially confirmed, and second, that the release of the information at the time it is received will not prove valuable to the enemy directly or indirectly. Most earnestly, I urge my countrymen to reject all rumors. These ugly little hints of complete disaster fly thick and fast in wartime. They have to be examined and appraised. As an example, I can tell you frankly that until further surveys are made, I have not sufficient information to state the exact damage which has been done to our naval vessels at Pearl Harbor. Admittedly, the damage is serious. But no one can say how serious until we know how much of this damage can be repaired and how quickly the necessary repairs can be made. I cite as another example a statement made on Sunday night that a Japanese carrier had been located and sunk off the canal zone. And when you hear statements that are attributed to what they call an authoritative source, you can be reasonably sure from now on that under these war circumstances, the authoritative source is not any person in authority. Many rumors and reports which we now hear originate with enemy sources. For instance, today the Japanese are claiming that as a result of their one action against Hawaii, they have gained naval supremacy in the Pacific. This is an old trick of propaganda which has been used innumerable times by the Nazis. The purpose of such fantastic claims are, of course, to spread fear and confusion among us and to goad us into revealing military information which our enemies are desperately anxious to obtain. Our government will not be caught in this obvious trap, and neither will the people of the United States. It must be remembered by each and every one of us that our free and rapid communication these days must be greatly restricted in wartime. It is not possible to receive full and speedy and accurate reports from distant areas of combat. This is particularly true where naval operations are concerned, for in these days of the marvels of the radio it is often impossible for commanders of various units to report their activities by radio at all, for the very simple reason that this information would become available to the enemy and would disclose their position and their plan of defense or attack. 
of necessity there will be delays in officially confirming or denying reports of operations but we will not hide facts from the country if we know the facts and if the enemy will not be aided by their disclosure to all newspapers and radio stations all those who reach the eyes and ears of the american people i say this you have a most grave responsibility to the nation now and for the duration of this war if you feel that your government is not disclosing enough of the truth you have every right to say so but in the absence of all the facts as revealed by official sources you have no right in the ethics of patriotism to deal out unconfirmed reports in such a way as to make the people believe that they are gospel truth every citizen in every walk of life shares this same responsibility the lives of our soldiers and sailors the whole future of this nation depend upon the manner in which each and every one of us fulfills his obligation to our country now a word about the recent past and the future a year and a half has elapsed since the fall of france when the whole world first realized the mechanized might which the axis nations had been building up for so many years america has used that year and a half to great advantage knowing that the attack might reach us all in too short a time we immediately began greatly to increase our industrial strength and our capacity to meet the demands of modern warfare precious months were gained by sending vast quantities of our war material to the nations of the world still able to resist axis aggression our policy rested on the fundamental truth that the defense of any country resisting hitler or japan was in the long run the defense of our own country that policy has been justified it has given us time invaluable time to build our american assembly lines of production assembly lines are now in operation others are being rushed to completion a steady stream of tanks and planes of guns and ships and shells and equipment that is what these eighteen months have given us but it is all only a beginning of what still has to be done we must be set to face a long war against crafty and powerful bandits the attack of pearl harbor can be repeated at any one of many points points in both oceans and along both coastlines and against all the rest of the hemisphere it will not only be a long war it will be a hard war that is the basis on which we now lay all our plans that is the yardstick by which we measure what we will need and demand money material doubled in quadruple production ever increasing the production must not be only for our own army and navy and air forces it must reinforce the other armies and navies and air forces fighting the nazis and the warlords of japan throughout the americas and throughout the world i have been working today on the subject of production your government has decided on two broad policies the first is to speed up all existing production by working on a seven-day week basis in every war industry including the production of essential raw materials the second policy now being put into form is to rush additions to the capacity of production by building more new plants by adding to old plants and by using the many smaller plants for war needs over the hard road of past months we have at times met obstacles and difficulties divisions and disputes indifference and callousness that is now all past and i am sure forgotten the fact is that the country now has an organization in washington built around men and women who are recognized experts in their own fields i think the country knows that the people who are actually responsible in each and every one of these many fields are pulling together with a teamwork that has never before been excelled on the road ahead there lies hard work grueling work day and night every hour and every minute i was about to add that ahead there lies sacrifice for all of us but it is not correct to use that word the united states does not consider its sacrifice to do all one can to give one's best to our nation when the nation is fighting for its existence and its future life it is not a sacrifice for any man old or young to be in the army or navy of the united states rather it is a privilege it is not a sacrifice for the industrialist or the wage earner the farmer or the shopkeeper 
the trainman or the doctor to pay more taxes to buy more bonds to forego extra profits to work longer or harder at the task for which he is best fitted rather it is a privilege it is not a sacrifice to do without many things to which we are accustomed if the national defense calls for doing without a review this morning leads me to the conclusion that at present we shall not have to curtail the normal use of articles of food there is enough food today for all of us and enough left over to send to those who are fighting on the same side with us but there will be a clear and definite shortage of metals of many kinds for civilian use for the very good reason that in our increased program we shall need for war purposes more than half of that portion of the principal metals which during the past year have gone into articles for civilian use yes we shall have to give up many things entirely and i am sure that the people in every part of the nation are prepared in their individual living to win this war i am sure that they will cheerfully help to pay a large part of its financial cost while it goes on i am sure they will cheerfully give up those material things that they are asked to give up and i am sure that they will retain all those great spiritual things without which we cannot win through i repeat that the united states can accept no result save victory final and complete not only must the shame of japanese treachery be wiped out but the sources of international brutality wherever they exist must be absolutely and finally broken in my message to the congress yesterday i said that we will make very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us in order to achieve that certainty we must begin the great task that is before us by abandoning once and for all the illusion that we can ever again isolate ourselves from the rest of humanity in these past few years and most violently in the past three days we have learned a terrible lesson it is our obligation to our dead it is our sacred obligation to their children and to our children that we must never forget what we have learned and what we have learned is this there is no such thing as security for any nation or any individual in a world ruled by principles of gangsterism there is no such thing as impregnable defense against powerful aggressors who sneak up in the dark and strike without warning we have learned that our ocean-girt hemisphere is not immune from severe attack that we cannot measure our safety in terms of miles on any map any more we may acknowledge that our enemies have performed a brilliant feat of deception perfectly timed and executed with great skill it was a thoroughly dishonorable deed but we must face the fact that modern warfare is conducted in the nazi manner is a dirty business we don't like it we didn't want to get in it but we are in it and we're going to fight it with everything we've got i do not think any american has any doubt of our ability to administer proper punishment to the perpetrators of these crimes your government knows that for weeks germany has been telling japan that if japan did not attack the united states japan would not share in dividing the spoils with germany when peace came she was promised by germany that if she came in she would receive the complete and perpetual control of the whole of the pacific area and that means not only the far east but also the islands in the pacific and also a stranglehold on the west coast of north central and south america we know also that germany and japan are conducting their military and naval operations in accordance with a joint plan that plan considers all peoples and nations which are not helping the axis powers as common enemies of each and every one of the axis powers that is their simple and obvious grand strategy and that is why the american people must realize that it can be matched only with a similar grand strategy we must realize for example that japanese successes against the united states in the pacific are helpful to german operations in libya that any german success against the caucasus is inevitably an assistance to japan in her operations against the dutch east indies that a german attack against algiers and morocco opens the way to a german attack against south america and the canal on the other side of the picture we must learn also to know that guerrilla warfare against the germans in let us say serbia or norway helps us 
that a successful Russian offensive against the German helps us, and that British successes on land or sea in any part of the world strengthen our hands. Remember always that Germany and Italy, regardless of any formal declaration of war, consider themselves at war with the United States at this moment just as much as they consider themselves at war with Britain or Russia. And Germany puts all the other republics of the Americas into the same category of enemies. The people of our sister republics of this hemisphere can be honored by that fact. The true goal we seek is far above and beyond the ugly field of battle. When we resort to force, and now we must, we are determined that this force shall be directed toward ultimate good as well as against immediate evil. We Americans are not destroyers. We are builders. We are now in the midst of a war, not for conquest, not for vengeance, but for a world in which this nation and all that this nation represents will be safe for our children. We expect to eliminate the danger from Japan, but it would serve us ill if we accomplished this and found that the rest of the world was dominated by Hitler and Mussolini. So we are going to win the war, and we are going to win the peace that follows. And in the difficult hours of this day, through dark days that may be yet to come, we will know that the vast majority of the members of the human race are on our side. Many of them are fighting with us. All of them are praying for us. But in representing our cause, we represent theirs as well. Our hope and their hope for liberty under God. End of section 19